in this episode of the Electromaker Educator, hosted by the most handsome engineer that Electromaker could find within a one mile radius, we will be exploring Texas Instruments' latest development, the MSP-M0C1104, the world's tiniest microcontroller to create what could be the world's smallest, intelligent, capable, line-following robot. If not that, then definitely the world's smallest line-following robot based on an ARM core. And um, if not that, then certainly the world's most smallest line-following robot based on an ARM core in this workshop. Cue the intro. I wanted to give a quick thanks to my friends, Texas Instruments, for sponsoring today's video. If there's one thing that can be said about modern electronics, it's that microcontrollers are absolutely essential in 99% of designs. I remember a time when circuits were built from discrete logic chips, timers, and comparators that would all work together to do something complex and amazing. But as soon as microcontrollers came into the picture, well, all of that got thrown out the window. Fast forward a few decades, and it's amazing to see what microcontrollers can be used for, what they pack, and how small and cheap they are. But just like all tech, our needs continue to increase, and this means that while many small low-cost microcontrollers are great, we can quickly use up their resources, making them struggle in our applications. But even microcontrollers that are cheap from a maker's perspective can quickly add up in cost if you want to purchase them in bulk. For example, a popular Wi-Fi sock, which won't be named, can cost a few bucks. And well, that's great for a small DIY project. But if you want to sell it and make a thousand, well, that cost will quickly spiral out of control. Thankfully, the company that brought the world the first integrated circuit, Texas Instruments, has heard your engineering cries, the long nights of component sourcing, the bottomless pit of despair, the fury of trying to find a microcontroller that works with your budget while packing a punch. In order to follow this video, you will need to get yourself an MSP-M0C1104 microcontroller, and the easiest way to do that is to get the Texas Instruments Launchpad LP MSP-M0C1104. This board integrates not just a microcontroller, but a programmer and a bunch of testing hardware along with jumpers, making it easy to prototype. At the same time, if you want to build the robot shown in this video, then you will need a few other things, including the PCB, a separate microcontroller, a variety of SMD components including resistors and capacitors, IR sensors and emitters, two little pager motors, and the world's most ugly battery made from sticking two lithium ion capacitors back to back and then slapping on a small linear regulator. Now, before we jump into the design of this boss, I should probably mention that there are a few things I would love to change. But because of how my brain works, I would never record this episode. Basically, I have a really bad habit of just making constant revisions and never completing the actual project. So if you experience that as well, let me know in the comments. So the whole point of this episode is based around the MSP-M0C1104 microcontroller. But what exactly is it? And why am I unusually excited about this microcontroller? Well, to start off with the corporate version of this excitement, this chip has an ARM M0 Plus core clocked at 24 megahertz, 16 kilobytes of flash, and one kilobyte of RAM, along with a 12-bit SAR ADC, 18 GPIO, UART, I2C, and SPI. Furthermore, it has five volt tolerant pins, not all the pins are tolerant, but this is still rare for microcontrollers, and an operating temperature of minus 40 to 125 degrees centigrade. There is an 8-pin SOT23 package for those who need a teeny tiny package, and a WQFN 20-pin package for those who need the I.O. Finally, TI also released this microcontroller in its chip form, an 8-pin DSBGA, which is smaller than, and I am not joking when someone said this, an uncooked grain of rice. Now, I appreciate that rice expands in size when cooked, but it's not much, and I love the fact that someone had to be specific during that comparison. Now, with those boring corporate benefits all said and done, here's the real reason why this microcontroller is an absolute killer of a product. 16 cents per chip for a reel of 1,000 is a price that I can't even comprehend. All of those features for a total of 16 cents at scale is almost criminal. 
Well, what this means is that this chip is super perfect for anyone looking to do mass production and the operating temperature range actually means that this chip could be used in far more than just commercial off-the-shelf equipment. Personally, I'm thinking industrial. But where you could go really crazy with such a device is having multiple of them in a single circuit, each doing something really specific. In fact, they are so cheap that you could have these as diagnostic monitoring devices that literally just watch voltage signals in a circuit for some larger processor, making sure that everything's in the green. Now, just to add fuel to the fire that is this microcontroller, I always judge a chip on its development environment because I can't stand chips that are hard to program or are reliant on some RTOS that adds layers of abstraction. Well, when I received my Launchpad dev board, I was honestly shocked at how easy it was to program. Firstly, Windows automatically recognized the board and needed no drivers. Secondly, the IDE, Code Composer Studio, was free to download and required no registration to download at all. Thirdly, it was easy to navigate and the options were nice and basic. But when I got to creating an example GPIO project, TI had the foresight to engineer common sense and realized that this chip was going to be used by idiots like me. And they gave us a systems configuration window. And oh my God, it's brilliant. I was getting hardware to work in no time with this config window. So honestly, TI, hats off. Going further, the studio has all the examples installed in its install directory. And there are plenty of good examples that you can go through. TI also has online examples in its TI developer zone, which are just as good. So be sure to check that out. But the best feature of all? Well, when I went to create my own project, I could select no RTOS. That's right, no need for awful abstraction layers and complex code. TI has a driver library interface, but this interface is trivial to use. And when you look at the system config code that is automatically generated when you make adjustments in the system config window, you can clearly see what variables you have for each peripheral, what they are called and what they expect. And this is where the ultimate litmus test comes. I was able to not bother with a single online tutorial, plugged it straight into my computer and got an LED flashing within minutes. What that means is that this microcontroller and the development environment around it is perfect. So it's clear that this chip is something that us engineers have been needing for so long, but let's now see how it will be crucial in our line following bot project. The bot that we will build will work on a really simple principle. Two infrared detectors will watch the ground directly below the robot and depending on what each sensor sees will determine how the robot will move. If the left sensor stops detecting the line, then the left motor will stay on while the right motor will turn off and this will turn the robot towards the right. If the right sensor stops detecting the line, then the right motor will turn on, turning the robot back onto track. The motors that we will use are pager motors to try and keep this design as small as possible and every component used will be an SMD part. Now we are using a microcontroller in this bot, meaning that we can get it to do a lot more than just follow a line. For example, we could make this thing do small turns depending on some sensor condition. We could make it perform a specific set of directions such as maze finding, but we could even in theory create a tiny neural network that could control the motors and give our bot decision-making capabilities. But for the sake of simplicity, we will stick with a line following robot. The biggest challenge that we face in this project is power because this robot is going to be tiny. To keep things simple, instead of integrating a DC-DC buck boost converter to take a tiny voltage up to some high level and then regulate that back down, I decided to be me in the most possible me way and strap two lithium titanate capacitors from Nichicon, see our previous episode on the OTI battery profiler, back to back and stuck a voltage regulator on top of that. The reason for this is that each of these capacitors is 2.5 volts and I can't power this chip directly with 5 volts. So the regulator knocks that down to 3.3. I, I know it's a terrible solution, but hey, the capacitors add the weight, which helps with ground contact and well, can't complain about the results, but it worked very well. The schematic for the line bot is really simple, consisting of a few passives, the sensor, some IR emitters and MOSFETs for controlling each motor. Because we are using a single MOSFET per pager motor, we can't control the direction of the motor, but that's okay because honestly, we are not planning on retreating. It's important to have a winning mentality, no reverse, no retreat, 
no surrender. The cool feature of the MOSFETs is that we don't need to add protection diodes to protect against motor voltage spikes as the MOSFETs have body diodes. Two potentiometers are included in the design to allow for adjusting the sensitivity of the IR sensors. In practice, I just had them set to their lowest value, making the sensors as sensitive as possible. Building the bot, whoa, whoa, Building the bot was not easy, and I regret not getting a stencil. A stencil would have allowed me to place all the components in one go and then solder them in my <coughs> reflow oven, which was never used for anything else other than soldering. However, I pursued this project with my surgeon-like skills. Soldering the TI chip was the first thing I did because it has an extremely small pin pitch. You could try to solder each leg, but you will struggle. So I used a bit of solder paste on either side, placed the chip down, into the oven and then solder wicked any remaining bridges. The rest of the components were all soldered manually. When you get to the IR sensor, you will need to be careful as there is no way of figuring out which pin is the anode. To find this pin, I had to use my multimeter set to the diode setting and probed it until it started conducting. Sadly, there were two mistakes on the PCB as I incorrectly assumed that all GPIO could be used with the ADC. So I had to cut two traces on the back of the PCB and then add two tiny microwires from the sensors to their new pins. Soldering these wires was the absolute bane of my life, which is why I'm so grateful that I have the world's cheapest digital microscope that cost like 40 bucks and it made all the difference. Finally, I jerry-rigged a small Molex connector onto the back, which I wish I had the proper pin spacing, so that it's easier to connect and disconnect from the programmer when updating the firmware. Getting the motors onto the PCB was loads of fun. No planning or thought went into this. I just got out the hot glue, dabbed a bit here and there, and then attached the motors at a roughly 45 degree angle on each side. Instead of trying to make little wheels, I used a bit of wire insulation as it's perfectly symmetrical. The Frankenstein lithium ion capacitor battery could have been done with more grace, but having said that, it gave me the best results with regards to power, reliability, and weight. If there isn't enough weight, the motors will struggle to make good contact with the ground and thus not move the bot. The code for the bot is really quite simple. The main program loop of the bot just takes ADC readings and from those readings determines which motor should be running. However, if I just switch the motors on, the bot goes a bit too fast, making it hard to control. So instead, I designed a bit banged PWM based on the time and peripheral. What this code demonstrates so well is how simple it is to use peripherals on a 32-bit ARM microcontroller, something which I haven't seen anywhere else. Now, there are a few things that I would like to point out which caused me great pain during the coding stage. The first point is that with the ADC, it's so important that you give the ADC enough time to take a reading. I stupidly had mine set to something like 625 nanoseconds, which is nowhere near enough time. Thus, I kept getting poor results of the same tiny number, meaning that the SAR hadn't finished. Extending this time to the tens or hundreds of microseconds makes all the difference. The second point is that with a timer, if your timing period is too fast, then the ADC can never complete. I am guessing this has something to do with the fact that the chip ends up in an infinite interrupt loop, meaning that the timer is always being prioritized. Considering that my timer interrupt routine is doing quite a lot, which you shouldn't do, I know, it's highly likely that this code was taking way too long between interrupts.
The MSP M0C1104 MCU and the rest of the MSP M0 portfolio are excellent low cost microcontrollers with an excellent amount of performance. To say that they are low cost doesn't even come close to really demonstrating what you get. Normally you have price, capability and quality and you get to pick two options, but with this chip you get to select all three. Because of this, they are excellent for mass production and I can think of many different applications they would do so well in. For example, they would be ideal for low energy applications that need a tiny microcontroller for anything from core processing to monitoring circuit performance. Their capabilities also make them great for adding complex logic into tiny circuits, so in theory, for some applications, you could replace a CPLD and discrete logic for one of these chips. In fact, taking this further, I'd like to combine multiple of these chips to control and monitor something more complex, including bus voltages, circuit behavior, tamper detecting, and much more. There are many microcontrollers on the market, and many claim to be low cost, small, and ideal for mass production. One such family of devices is the extremely popular STM8 range of micros, and yes, they are good micros, being 8-bit, simple, and easy to use. Now, this new chip blows them out the water on price and capability, but it's not co-compatible, meaning that you have to rewrite code when migrating. Oh wait, no you don't. TI decided to extract the soul from its competitors' tears and rub it into their wounds by creating the STM8 S2 MSSP migration tool, meaning that you can take an STM8 project, turn it into MSPS code, and then deploy. Talk about a power flex. The MSP M0 portfolio of microcontrollers are really awesome, and this MSP M0C1104 MCU is the cherry on top. While this line following bot doesn't come close to demonstrating the capabilities of this tiny micro, it certainly shows how easy it is to use and develop with. The Launchpad dev board is great for working with the MSP M0 devices, and its integration of both a programmer and target device allows for rapid prototyping even if you are on the go. The footprint and minimum circuitry needed for this chip is nice and simple, and the fact that it can replace devices like the STM8 range makes it as funny as it is great. So with that said, it's time to end this episode of the Electromaker Educator. If you like what we do here at Electromaker, then hit the like button, smash the subscribe button, leave a comment with what you would do with this chip for a chance to win your own launchpad, and if you want to build this bot and get the parts for many other wacky designs, then head over to the Electromaker store. This is Robin Mitchell, signing off.